Good morning, Bucknutters. Welcome to the Bucknuts Morning 5 here on Monday, June 8th, 2020. I am Dave Biddle, and I'm very happy to be joined by our special guest. I'm fired up about this. He is G. Scott Sr. He's, of course, the father of Ohio State true freshman wide receiver G. Scott Jr. And G. and I on today's show, we're going to talk a lot about football and, and what the players are doing now with them reporting back to campus. Um, they'll be getting voluntary workouts later today, which is really cool. We're going to talk about the rise of G. Scott Jr., and we're going to talk about G. Scott Sr.'s really interesting background. He works for the Seattle Seahawks. He has a radio show in Seattle. Really cool stuff there. So we're going to get to all of that. But G., before we get to that, I'm going to give you the floor and just you know, have you talk about whatever you want to talk about, about what's been going on with, in our country with racial injustice and the Black Lives Matter movement, and if you feel as though this time might be any different. No, it's absolutely different. And I like to use the word from through all of this is would be encouraged, right? Um, what you're seeing across the country is something that has been talked about uh, in the past. You're seeing conversations that are being had. But the difference is this time is that when you turn on the TV, you are seeing it. before when you saw the civil rights movement and you would see sprinkles there of uh, white people standing there with Dr. Martin Luther King and other civil rights leaders of the past. Now you are seeing the entire country, all 50 states. You saw 18 countries that are a part of this movement. You take the, the state of Idaho, the city, Boise, Boise, Idaho, right there, where the population is 1.5% Black. However, they have been out there protesting in the streets. Small towns here in the state of Washington, same thing. I can't say what's going on in Ohio, but I know that I saw them in Cleveland. I saw it in Cincinnati. I saw it in Columbus. Um, it, it is now a conversation, and now it is a conversation that's been long overdue. And I'm encouraged because now you have corporations. Now you have big companies um, having these conversations and talking about it. Is it uncomfortable? Sure. It's definitely uncomfortable, which has been the problem for so many years. For so many years, it was never the right time. For so many years, it was, hey, a little uncomfortable. Let's not talk about that. But now we are kind of forced to have it, if you will. So I think I would use the word encouraged because we are having these conversations. And as you, as you talked about and mentioned, yes, I do. I have a radio show. And I'm in a unique position because uh, – on my radio show, being the only black man on radio uh, in the state of Washington, right? Yeah. I tend to get some. I, I tend to get some emails, right? And I've and in the past, I've gotten some hateful emails in the past, nasty emails, emails that I that I keep so that I can show these things in the future when I write my book. However, here's what's interesting, Dave. Over the last two weeks. I have gotten more emails from people that have admitted that they are racist, people that are saying that, hey, you know what, I am trying to do better. And that's encouraging because I, as a matter of fact, there's a guy, I won't mention his name, I, I, don't, I keep all the names anonymous. There is a guy that uh, he hit me up maybe about a week ago and he was very detailed in his, to his racism telling me stories. This guy right now is holding family meetings with his entire family, talking to them, explaining to them why he has been wrong. This is 2020, not 1968. So again, there's a lot of people who are starting the conversations. And when you do that, when you're transparent and you're, and you're, and you're talking about it, even though it's uncomfortable, that is something to be encouraged about. You know, the whole saying, I think it was, I think it was Denzel Washington that said, nobody can go back and start a new beginning, but anyone can start today to make a new ending. You know what I mean? And I think that the, my job as someone who's on the radio every single day is to walk a fine line between educating 
and insinuating. And it's easy to do sometimes to insinuate because what ends up happening is that comes from a place of emotion. That comes from a place of how come you're not hearing me? And Dave, right now on the phone, if, if I keep telling you something for years and years and years and years and years, and then finally, finally, let's just say I'm in my, we're in our 40s, right? And come to find out, you can tell your, or your listeners that our birthdays are two days apart and, and everything. But it gets to the point where finally one day you say to me, you know, G, I finally understand what you're saying. Now, I have a choice right there, right? I have a choice to accept that or not. But you can't ask people to change if you refuse to allow people that opportunity to do that. So I'll sum it up with this. What's going on across America is that people's hearts are changing. What's going on across America is the conscious of good people is starting to awake. Better late than never. I'm grateful for it. Very well said. It feels almost trite to talk about football after that very profound statement. Um, <laughs> but let's let's get into some football, my friend. Sure. Let's start with the rise of G Junior. You know, I love asking parents this. When when did you know that your son was going to be a big time college football player and perhaps an NFL player? When did it kind of hit you for real? Oh, oh wow. I um maybe maybe his junior year in high school i think that um i think it was the recruitment process of uh the ohio state university that kind of solidified that i thought early on maybe in his freshman year that he would maybe play college ball i thought that that was a possibility i thought Mm, that'd be pretty good. And then maybe his sophomore year, 10th grade, I thought, okay, maybe he could maybe play in the Pac-12 or, or something like that, one of those schools, and then go there. And I think it was uh, the, when the recruitment started for uh, the Buckeyes, where when it started, I personally didn't think that he was on that level yet. I, I didn't think that he was ready for something like that. And when that recruitment started, man, once the decision was made, when he made the decision to commit to the Buckeyes, and to be exact, he committed on Christmas of 2018. Once he did that, it's, it was a switch. He changed. He was a completely different person. I have not, I have not had to, um, say anything to him about working out. I haven't had to say anything to him about his commitment to football. I would say since December 25th of 2018, I would say that he has worked out probably six days a week since that time. And if he did take off, it was because um, maybe he took off to go do some yoga or something like that. So I think once I saw the commitment, right, once I saw that, I think that was the first time that I realized that, hey, he has maybe a shot to play big time college football. Because, of, you know, Davis, as being around an NFL team for 17 years, I know what commitment looks like. I know what work looks like, you know, and everybody says, oh, well, my baby works out two, three times a week. Well, that sounds good. You know what I mean? But if you if you want to be the best of the best, there has to be a really like a big time commitment to working towards your craft. And I'm not talking about the commitment being from the parent. The commitment has to be with the child. So I think it was then. I want to get into the, kind of the genesis of how G became a Buckeye. Was it um, Brian Hartline reaching out to him? Just take us through the story of how that relationship first started and how it be, continued to build to him being a Buckeye. Well, yeah, um, Brian Hartline uh, texted me. I don't know how he got my number, but he, he texted me and everything and introduced himself and, you know, was wondering if we want to come out and visit Columbus, Ohio. And, you know, I don't know if your listeners want to hear this, but maybe you guys want to hear some transparency. I said offline, hell no, we ain't, we ain't going out to, ain't going out to Columbus. You're not going to be, you're not going to Ohio State. You know, so I, I you know, text him back, hey, nice to meet you. You know, but it kind of, kind of was blowing him off, 
in a way, you know. I just wasn't really wasn't really too serious about that and told my son about it and I just just kind of suggested to him like nah I don't think that's a good place for you to go. And I think it was Tracy Ford. And I think I know it was Tracy Ford, um, the person that trains my son, who was a big time advocate of saying that he needs to go and and, and check out the place. And I was like, well, I got to work. As you guys know, I'm an auctioneer on the weekends. And I was like, so, and he's not going by himself. So we're never going to go out there. And so it was Tracy Ford that said, okay, well, I'll go. So Tracy Ford went out there and we going out there. I think that was the beginning of that relationship. I don't know who that game was against. I think it was the game was against the University of Indiana at home at the Buckeyes in two, October or something like that, 2018. And that kind of started the uh, relationship with uh, Brian Hartline and, and myself and my son, and it, it got cool. And then, of course, you've got to sprinkle in. Got to, you can't forget about Coach Key, Keenan Bailey, you know what I mean? And uh, it kind of developed from there. Who was the runner-up? If he wasn't a Buckeye, was there a runner-up, a clear runner-up? Well, by the time the decision was made for the Buckeyes, there was not even a second place. I mean, it wasn't even close. However, I will say that I would say the schools that were were in there were Notre Dame was definitely a a, a good one, um, and University of Oregon was a good one. So I would say that those two uh, schools right there would probably kind of go one A and one B for runner ups. The story about you basically blowing off Coach Hartland when he first called you—that's that's hilarious. I love hearing these, you know, these backstories, and especially when they have happy endings. That's that's so funny. That's great insights right there. And I, you know, as you know, Coach Day's talked about, and everybody's talked about. You know, this was a time during the three-month quarantine when you know most guys were back home, where you can either get better, or you're going to get worse. And looks like G Junior has been busting his butt, and you know, just you've talked about that a little bit already, but. Just get into what he was doing during the quarantine and just how hard he was working. Well, you know, first I want to start off with 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 saying that even though my son had a commitment to working out before he came to the Buckeyes, he, he, your listeners or Buckeye fans and everybody knows the legend of Coach Mick and what he does for that strength and conditioning program. And I, and I, I got to tell you, you know, I thought it was overhyped, to be honest with you. I thought that why are everybody giving so much praise to this Mick guy? Like, who, I don't understand what's so special. So I know that my son's going to go out there and he's going to do his working out and it's going to be fine. Well, I was wrong. I was 100% wrong. The The mindset that my son has now because of the Buckeye strength conditioning program is unparalleled because he was out there for that three months. And because he was, it was the drive and it was the, the pushing through of sets and it was the, okay, I'm done. And when you're done, no, actually you have eight more reps. When you start doing that, you now have pushed through much uh, past the physical. Now everything you're talking about is all on the mental. And so when you are able to tap in to the mental in your workout, see, Dave, I'm old, bruh. I'm not touching no mental. When I'm physical and I'm physically tired, I'm done. Well, when you start tapping into the mental of that athlete, now you're talking about a drive that gets into them that's unmatched. And so what happened is because him being out there for three months, he came back and he brought that mentality back with him. So he brought that mentality to compete with the best. Now, when you start talking about some of the best to ever do it in college and pro and the Bobby Wagner's of the world and the Richard Sherman's of the world, and you, I mean, (laughs) there's a lot of ego that's involved. There's a lot of, I don't want anybody to beat me that's involved. And so when he was around that every single day out here, there is a competition that is just crazy. So every single morning, what he would do is, and by the way, got to thank the Buckeyes for this. 
every single morning, he's out the house at 5.30. Workouts begin at 6 a.m. Because that's because of what he learned there. And also, he's in bed, sleep by 9.30 every single night because of what he learned there. Because you want to make sure that your mental right, is able to sustain. That way your physical is fine. And so when he was out here, that's what he did, Dave, the entire time. Worked out uh, religiously all the time, just getting right, getting his body right. And um, I, I think he's in the best physical shape that he's ever been in. He came back here. He was 212 pounds when he was when he got back here from Ohio State. Uh, now he's going back there at 216. You know, so we'll see. Now, first of all, you've got to stop calling yourself an old man. You're a young man. You're two days younger than me. So you're a very young man. (laughs) Um, Yeah. I mean, as we mentioned, the the players are going to start voluntary workouts later today on Monday, which is such great news. Um, Give us some insights. I I believe they're going to be in small groups and there's going to be all kinds of medical protocols in place. We don't need to get into medical protocols, but just what kind of program you think coach Mick's going to have them on this month? I mean, I, I, well, Whatever program he's going to be on, he's going to be on a program that I'm not going to underestimate ever again. That's first of all. And so whatever program they're going to have. But uh, I, I think that Coach Mick and we've had conversations. We had a, a team meeting, uh, Coach Day and Coach Mick was on that call. And uh, and then I think we there's understanding, right? Like on Monday or these voluntary workouts, there you're going in there with the understanding of let's see what we have. Like, you know, what we have gone through is unprecedented, right? Um, We've never been in a situation where we had a global pandemic impact us all this way, unless you were alive in 1918. And you just said I was a young man, so I wasn't. So therefore, if you start start talking about um, right uh, right now, I think the plan is, is for them to go back and find out where they are. Okay. You know, these guys are here, these guys are there. And I, I think you just got to work from there. And I think this week will probably be finding out where the guys are physically. I know you don't speak for all the parents, but I'm sure you talk to a lot of the parents or are, are there any parents that have some trepidation about this? It sounds like most of the parents are like completely on board. It sounds like all the players are on board. Is there anybody who's like an outlier? Who's like, I'm I'm not really sure if the players should be coming back this soon. They might be concerned about the virus. Are you hearing any of that, G? Well, um, if if you hear me say, yeah, I talked to a bunch of parents, uh, let me be very uh, 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 transparent with you guys. I only talked to two. Uh, and, th- and those two are uh, uh, Jackson's, <laughs> Jackson Smith. I talked to his dad, and I talked to Monica Johnson, which is Paris Johnson's mom. Those are the only parents I talk to. So if I have an opinion about the parents, just know that you can blame them. So uh, no, those those two parents are very excited about uh, the child being back. And one of the, one of the things that we talked about, and like I said, so if you're talking about my parent circle of the people that I talk to, it's quite simple. Let's be real. Our babies are safer there than they are here. You know what I mean? Like it's not it's not rocket science. They got all the all the the, the medicines, the doctors, and everybody safe, the protocols and everything. I mean, I like to think that I'm safe in my house, but I mean, come on now, Dave. I mean, you know, it's probably going to be safer there than it would be uh, back back at home. So I think that's really the, where the conversation has been. So again, anytime you ever ask me a question about what the parents are saying, just just blame. Mata and uh, Monica Johnson, you know. Well, if we're talking a year from now, you're going to probably know half the parents on the roster because you guys are going to be traveling to games and getting to know each other a lot better. So that's going to be fun to watch all the uh, the parents. That's always a cool thing to see all the parents get to know each other and everything. Uh, but I had, I had no idea you were only talking to, to two parents. Um, I, want to, I want to ask about Coach Day. I, from everything I hear and just from what I've seen myself, it seems like he's handled this whole thing like a champ. Um, hmm. Just your thoughts on how Coach Day has handled – uh, the quarantine with the players and how he's handled recent events. He just seems to, I know I'm biased here because I love the guy. Um, he just seems to knock it, everything out of the park, G. You know, um, I, had a, I had an opinion about Coach Ryan Day when I first met him, uh, first got to know him and get a relationship with him. And whatever that opinion I had of him was, again, this is another time where I was wrong, but I was wrong in a different way. I thought he was a great guy before. He has knocked it out of the park 
of the type of human being that he is. When you when you start thinking about like this are conversations, right? Where our sons, I'm speaking as a parent now, they go off and they play for these head coaches for college universities. I hope that most understand that it's a business, number one. Like you can't, like you, you can't get away. I mean, college football is $4 billion a year, right? So there is a business in this. <clears throat> so you kind of understand that you might not have the relationship with the coach that you might, might have had during the recruiting time. And I got to tell you, this coach day is far and ahead better of a man than I thought he was. Um, I've received two phone calls from uh, Coach Day, and that's been recently, you know, and just kind of wanted to call me up during it. As a matter of fact, I didn't even – look, check this out. I didn't even know it was Coach Day the first, like, 30 seconds of the phone call. So we're, we're talking about things that's going on. And finally, he said something that I kind of, I could hear his accent a little bit. You know, you know, Coach Ryan Day, if you guys notice, he, he talks a certain way. And he said something, and I said, wait a minute. I looked at my phone, I'm like, oh, man, this is Coach Day. But uh, anyways, for any fan of the Buckeyes, anybody that's closely associated with this football team, I got to tell you, you have to be more than grateful to have this man leading this team. I mean, I, and I'm and I'm not just saying that. Foot, throw, put, put the football aside. I'm not even talking about football right now, you know, because we haven't done anything. So I'm not talking about football. I'm talking about as a man, like what he has done as a leader, as a you, – when you think um, the head coach of a football team, you think the CEO of a company, right? You, you think that type of leader. Like Ryan Day is someone that if they – if there was a, uh, a a world summit and leaders needed to be present, I'd say, yo, St. Coach Ryan Day, he needs to go be present. He needs to go speak on behalf of this Midwest region. It's an incredible coaching staff from the top down. It's just he, he's the man and he's put together a an absolute stellar staff all the way around, obviously, including Coach Mick and all of the assistant coaches. It's just it's it's just so exciting to to see that coaching staff. Let me ask you this. Were you ever worried? And not that we're completely out of the woods yet. We don't know what the world's going to look like two months from now. But I'm pretty encouraged that we're going to have a college football season. I think I'd put it like at 99%. But I was worried at one point. Were you ever worried, G, that we were not going to have a college football season this year? Yes. And, and here's why. Here's why I was worried. I was worried that if we did get to the point where we did not have a college football season, then college football was not going to be the biggest concern that we all had. Did you, does that make sense? Absolutely. If we, yes. if we, if we did not have a college football season, this, this is how I would think before, then we got other things. We're, 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 we're talking about like, Hey, we're having real conversations within our families. We're having real conversations on, Hey, how are we going to survive? You know? So, Yes, there was a point in time that I thought that maybe early on in this pandemic, but I'm with you now. I'm with you and with a lot of people. I, I'm encouraged. Uh, I do think that there's going to be a college football season. Funny you should ask. I don't know if I should share this, but, uh, you know, it's kind of weird on the interview sharing my dreams. But I just had a dream last night about a socially distanced Buckeye game. <laughs> I, was, I, I just had that dream last night. And, and, and like, um, if you were a family, then you were allowed to sit together and everything. And so it's all these d different little clusters and everything. So it's, it's crazy. I just had that. Not, not that I want to bore your listeners with my dreams. No, you're not boring us at all. That, um, that might have been a premonition more than a dream. I, you know, I, we did a story. Ohio, this is, as if we didn't already know how great Ohio State fans are and how crazy they are about football. They've already sold 44,000 season tickets. Last year, they had sold around 50,000 at the same time. That is crazy that there's just that minor drop off in season ticket sales in the middle of a pandemic when people don't even know for sure if there's going to be fans in the stands. But I think that might have been a premonition and not a, a dream. Uh, now I want to get into, as promised, your background. You have such a cool background. Uh, as you mentioned, you're an auctioneer. Um, you've worked for the Seattle Seahawks 17 years, I believe you said. Uh, you have your own radio show in Seattle. Um, just you know, talk about how you how you came up as you know with the C, with the Seahawks and 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 tell the listeners about your radio show. Well, um, 
I was a car detailer. So in 2003, I, um, I was cleaning cars. And so I thought, hmm, maybe it'd be a good idea to drive up to where the Seattle Seahawks practice over in Kirkland, Washington and see if I can clean their vehicles. But I knew it wouldn't be a good idea to go in the front door because you know how that is. It'd be easy turned away. So I waited around the back door, if you will. And I did that around 530 in the morning, waited there. And uh, there was a gentleman that came and I asked if it was okay if I can clean their car for free and let them know what I can do. And uh, they said yes. I mean, that's, cra that's crazy, right? Like close to six, six o'clock in the morning and, and you let someone clean your car that you don't know if they're going to take off in the car or not, but they let me. And then afterwards, um, they came down with Coach Mike Holmgren's car and they said, hey, can you clean this? And I cleaned it and they asked me if I can come back the next day. And for for about 11 years, that's what I did. I came back day after day on a handshake. No contract, no nothing. Everything was a handshake. Well, during that time, I mean, you, you sometimes you ever had you ever heard the saying, sometimes you don't know what you don't know. And it, it reminds me of uh, the karate kid when Daniel's son and Mr. Miyagi and he had Daniel's son wax on, wax off for all that time. And then Daniel's son's like, man, listen. I'm washing all these cars. I ain't doing nothing. You're supposed to be teaching me how to fight. Well, come to find out, Daniel's son, he knew some stuff because of the wax on and wax off. Well, you take somebody who has been cleaning cars for a NFL team for all these years. And so they're cleaning cars and that's what they're doing. And then all of a sudden in 2010, this new head coach from USC by the name of Pete Carroll, he's there now and he's going to, quote, make things uh, better and have this championship mindset. And you're like, yeah, yeah, OK, whatever, buddy, whatever. And so you see Earl Thomas being drafted and then the you see Cam Chancellor that year. He was drafted, I believe, in the fourth, fifth round. Then the next year, you see Richard Sherman. And then in 2012, you see this Russell Wilson dude. You see this Bobby Wagner dude. And so you see all of these pieces that are coming. And then you start noticing things like with Russell Wilson. Um, back then when he was a rookie, Russell would always – I used to be like, man, why, does, why is this dude always beating me? Because I would get there really early. I'm like, why is this Russell dude always beating me? And why is he parking – in the same spot, Russell would park in number 47, right? I'm like, man, he always beat early. Then it became like this competition between like Russell and, 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 and Cam and all of the, 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 these, these new guys. They would all try to beat each other there in the morning. It was a competition. So you start seeing these things happen. And then you see the Seahawks win the Super Bowl and you see the defense and you see how great there was and all this legion of boom. And you're like, man, you know, and here I am, I'm still washing cars, right? Then all of a sudden, I had a buddy of mine like, hey man, I'm gonna go down to the radio station. You wanna come with me? And I'm like, oh yeah, sure. And I go down to the radio station and they, start talking and I have my opportunity. I start talking and they ask, have you ever done this before? And so we end up doing a podcast and we did a podcast for about two months. And then after about, yeah, about two months, they asked if we wanted to go live on the air on the sports channel. And I said, sure. So I was at work, I was cleaning cars and Marshawn Lynch pulls up and I said, Hey, Sean, we call him Sean. Sean, look, man, I need a favor. I need you to come do an interview with me. And then that way it will help me out and it'd be a big deal. And he's like, I got you. Now, during this time, Marshawn Lynch wasn't doing interviews. Marshawn Lynch comes on, does the interview, boom, the rest is history. So back to my point of sometimes you, you don't know what you don't know. I didn't realize that for all those years, I was a fly on the wall watching champions being built watching a super bowl team being built i'm there four or five days a week dave right seeing all of the best of the best seeing the ups and seeing the downs and everything so 
So not only did it help me be able to go out, and so today I get to go out and speak to companies. I get to speak to kids. I get to do motivational speaking. I get to do auctioneering. I get to do radio. But where did that come from? When it came from that example, like Mr. Miyagi and Daniel's son, the wax on, wax off, because I got to see it. I didn't read what I'm telling you in a book. I saw it firsthand. And so, well, what could I do with the recipe I learned? Oh, I know what I can do. I can go ahead and take that recipe and apply it to home. So I can put this, give this recipe to my son. Like it's no coincidence that he is playing at Ohio State. I didn't know that that would happen, but he was able to see that. So who does he work out with today? Richard Sherman, Bobby Wagner, all of the guys that in the beginning that I just was the wax on, wax off. You don't know what you don't know. This was fantastic stuff. I could talk to you for two hours. I've already kept you much longer than I than I told you I would keep you. I really appreciate this, G. This has been a ton of fun. I hope we get a chance to do it again. And thank you so yeah. much for your time. This has been so much fun. All right, brother. Appreciate you, man. Appreciate you and go Bucks. Go Bucks is right. And thanks to all the listeners out there for tuning in the show. I appreciate that as well. Let's hear that Buckeye swag, best damn band in the land. Bye.